You are listening to an exclusive interview on Bass Musician Magazine. The interview starts now. Hey everybody, this is Raul for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the great honor and pleasure of chatting with bassist for Snake Eyes 7, Mike Sillis. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Mike's talking to us directly via Skype from Canada, our great neighbor up to the north. And so we're really happy to have this opportunity to chat today, Mike. As I always like to start, a lot of our readers would like to know a little about your journey as a musician. How did you get started in music and in bass? Well, I come from an era where every family had a piano in the house. All your aunts and all played the piano. And so music was a big part. What got me going with bass, I really my brother, David, back as early as, you know, when I was eight years old, slugging his guitar in class. And in my first performance in front of my class, grade three, playing Jingle Bells on a D string, but just D. So it was like D, 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 D. <laughs> And had, the, you know, the phrasing, and they clapped, and it was wonderful, right? Mm -hmm. And then later on, you know, even in grade five, we would, um, on Friday afternoons, I was in some form of open education experimental program, so on Friday afternoons, they would allow us to get the, you know, the acoustics and play Partridge Family songs to the class, you know, three of us, and sort of went like that, and then until I finally got, um, got a bass, 1971 or 72, and the first bass was an L gas with a Darius amp from Eaton's store. I don't know if they have Eaton's where you are, but, you know, and I had that for, I think the first cassette tape I ever owned was Santana Abraxas, and I sort of learned that on my El Vegas bass through my Darius amp and started, and that was it. I, I loved it. My brother played guitar, and I played bass until I was, I don't know, grade seven when I finally, finally got a Gibson EBO bass, which, you know, sort of sound like good. <laughs> and played like that for a while, which got me in my first, live gig was because I had a Gibson bass, you know, a big deal, right, in the neighborhood. It mm -hmm. wasn't a day gas or whatever. Well, coming from the young age, you were playing with groups very hands-on. Did you pursue uh, any formal training or musical education? Yeah, I guess even before the first bass, the Ontario Conservatory of Music. I think the greatest thing I learned there, because it was group lessons, was to not have the headstock beside the other guy's face while you're tuning. <laughs> That was the first thing they taught us, you know, and that was great, you know, and then, of course, stick little green dots where all the G's are on your fingerboard, and black for E, red for A, and so on, which later on I found coincides actually with color sound for people who tune by ear, you know, church pipe organ and stuff. It was really interesting, the association with color and, and frequency, right? You know, and, and then I always played bass. I, I, was, I never really wanted to, I mean, I could touch on anything, right, like anybody could make a note, make a noise with anything, but. I'm not a frustrated guitar player and a bass player. I guess about 15 years old, I was out of school. So unfortunately, I never had the opportunity to pursue jobs with bands that I wanted to because it became a way of you know, getting a sandwich was to play my guitar. I was on the road at 17 playing for an Elvis impersonator, which, you know, it was great because in hindsight, because all my buddies were in the basement playing, you know, Smoke on the Water or Led Zeppelin tunes, but I was playing six nights a week at 17 on the road, playing everything from My Way to Teddy Bear, mm -hmm. which was a great education in itself, right? Learning, not even knowing the name of what you're doing, but just learning and years of that, right? Playing, I became a jobber long before I became a hard rock player. I was playing bluegrass bands, country bands, every, every genre you could think of. And it changed all the time just for a form, like for a means of getting something to eat and somewhere to stay, right? And that was it. And the next thing I know, it was, you know, the 1980s at Big Rock. That was a great time for me because I was still really young, but all the other cats that I was, you know, competing for jobs and stuff were, you know, 18, 20 year old guys just starting to play, where I had 10 years of Chuck Berry in my, in my pocket, right? Mm -hmm. Which added a lot more depth to my performance, right? As you got older and you had a repertoire to pull from and play with bands, I'd noticed that you actually had played with quite a few bands during the following years after that. Yeah, I mean, well, even jobbing, it was, it was incredible. The people, you know, I mean, from an ex-wrestler, Sweet Eddie C.P., to the Belmonts, the Shirelles, Bo Diddley, B.W. Pauly from Ronnie Hawkins, and the list just goes on of all these people you meet and work with, the connections you make, and later on, 
Like that first band I was telling you about when I was 12 with the Gibson bass, we actually had a horn section in 19... Because every band did in 62, so we were playing, you know, like Beginnings from Chicago in grade 7, and the trumpet player in that band was actually was Freddie Kirchie, who was a singer from Sheriff and Alias. Good contacts going way back, how we all developed over the years. Of course, he went on to do great things. He was our trumpet player. So. And with that wealth of experience, when did you join uh, Snake Eyes 7? First of all, the you know, Cam McLeod and Eric Young, the drummer, used to be in White Wolf, uh, a recording band back in the 80s. And after that project, me and, me and Eric have played in several bands together. He's my right hand. Like, if there was ever a drummer that was made for me, it's him. Mm -hmm. So we've been playing together since 1986, on and off. And then when the time, the beginning of this Medicine at the Man project, Cam was producing, he produced and played on the last album, too. So they were in need of upgrade, I guess, as they taught their rhythm section. And that's where me and Eric came in. And, you know, we'd, we would also be doing a yearly fundraiser in Ed Edmonton, Alberta, every for the last few years at that time. So we were back in with our chops together. And it was so it was, it was just a natural fit. It's almost like, you know, even when I look at a picture of Snake Guy 7, it's like we've always been together. We're a gang. I and mean, that's what I prefer, to be a gang of musicians. And, you know, it looks like we've been together since before we are ever, and that's and that's how I feel about it, and that's how we play together, we think together, we party together. We're all buddies, you know. We have each other's back, so it's really great, you know. And of course, the Madman, Paul Stevens, our our main guy, it's, it just goes great. And then, of course, I haven't mentioned that Danny Dean, our singer. You know, interesting enough, his first time back in the early '80s in Western Canada was on a on a double bill with Eric, our drummer. So we've all known each other since I guess you know the early '80s easily. So it's great. It's a great history, and it's just natural that we're all here now uh, with the Medicine Man project. The band recently released Medicine Man. I had a chance to look at a couple of the videos, especially the official video for Medicine Man itself. I see exactly what you're talking about, where it does look like you guys, a very seasoned group, the way the machinery is working very smoothly all together, like you've been playing together all your lives. And that was kind of the concept I got. Keeping the torch of heavy metal from back of the day alive as it is because it's kind of evolved a lot of the music has is kind of progressed into different things but i found this to be classic metal because it kind of is what is reminiscent of some of my recollections of back in those days so it is a very true representation of this genre oh definitely like a uh, european melodic rock and even touching back on when I, I told you i used to be a jobber and i played all genres the thing is, is that this is my true passion. This is what I, this is natural fit. If you know, if you were to say, what, you know, what have you evolved to as a bass player in your life? This is it. When I play, I sound like me, I play like me. And I'm, you know, after, I don't know, what is it, 50 years of playing bass, if there's anything I've gotten out of it, it's that if I listen to a recording in the background of myself, I know that it's me because I play like me and I sound like me. It's, it's even funny, I was thinking the other day that, you know, when you ask me who's your, you know, your your favorite bass players or who do you listen to? And it's like, of course, my roots. When I was 11 years old, I, I owned a radio station in Toronto, Chum. And you would, if you got through, you'd win a beach towel or a ball or something. And they actually mailed me, like I was 11, and they mailed me a copy of Yes, Fragile and Black Sabbath Paranoid. They must have both come out at the same time. And so those, lo and behold... Caesar Butler and Chris Squire are two of my greatest influences, as well as John Entwistle. Funny thing now is that I don't really listen to bass players. I don't have a lot of interest in other bass players. I, and I'm just being honest, I, I'm interested in drummers and guitar players or, or singers. But when I listen to a band, I don't really listen to the bass player, especially if I'm going to be playing the tunes. I just put me into it. Bass players are, you know, I don't really listen to the bass. I don't know if that makes any sense to other bass players out there, but... That's, you know, I don't even, I never, it's just a natural evolution, right, of, you know, to where I come. And, of course, the way I play is, is, is unique, and that's the one thing that I'm proud of after all these years is that I do. I don't sound like that guy or play like that guy. I sound like me, and I play like me, which, which should be natural after all those years for anybody, no matter what you do, right? I don't know if that makes sense to you, but... It does. Since you've got your sound, how do you get that instrument or gear-wise? How do you get your bass voice? Well, and that's, that's a really big deal to me. You know? Even when I was younger, I had buddies that were sound techs, 
And I go out and help them on shows. I always found like when the whole band's playing and, and huge shows, all I hear is this clicking sound on the bass. I'd never hear, you know, during a sound check, the bass sounded killer. And then when the band's playing, where's the bass? Turn it up, it was all this 2K clicking in the front. At the very least, I can't never have that. I'd rather be buried and not hear me than hear just that clicking. I got the very first Tom Schultz bass rock man ever sold in Canada. Back, I don't know, 1980. I still have the receipt somewhere. Oh, I got it because it was a neat little thing, but I actually have about 13 of them now because they don't make them. Because I can't play without one now. It changed the way I play. Other buddies go, Well, how do you get that sound? And they'll pick up the plug into a rock band, and it doesn't work for them because it's taken years of it's like playing a Leslie or a Hammond organ is not the same as playing a piano. You're if you're a Hammond player, you have to learn how to finesse that that creature. Mm -hmm. uh, the Rockman is like that too, right? I mean, there's certain things about it and it changed the way my right hand works. So as far as sound goes, you know, I play DC Rich Basie since 1979. I mean, I have Rickenbackers, it's, I had that before. But, you know, when you go into a music store, they go, well, I'll plug you into this amp. Oh no, I just, if I want to play the bass, I don't want an amp. The bass has a sound. If I need volume, I'll touch the wall with it or the chair. And the very first time I picked up the DC Rich Koa Eagle and I played a note and it just rang and rang and rang. And I couldn't believe the sustain I had other than this thump that I had before that. And that changed everything for me. And then the rock. And so my sound, you know, back in the, in the early 80s when digital came out, I had racks of Ashley preamps with uh, parametric EQ, then a one-third octave graphic EQ and a crossover and power amps, and then the PC Rich bass came with like 11 buttons and switches, and you'd be playing and get a sound finally, and plus your strings, well, you know, how, how are your strings? Because I actually change my strings every day. So I know some guys go months, I, because of the rock band, you have to have fresh strings. As far as I'm concerned, I played, once I play one note on that string, it's deteriorating. It's, every note, it goes down. Anyways, I'd be playing, and i have all these buttons and switches, and and that really doesn't, that's not your sound. That's just for your monitor, right? And a, 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 my finger might hit one of the preamp buttons on the bass, and I'd be changing the EQ, trying to get my sound back. So in the end, I, well, I use Marshall amplification now, so it basically has a bass and a treble control, a volume. And on my, my very first Eagle, the HPC Rich that I ever bought, I had it gutted, and all I have is an on and off switch. I don't have a volume. I don't have a tone. I run EMG active pickups instead of the old passive DiMarzios, which tightened up the sound, and my sound comes out of my hand. I can hear my sound without an amp. I can just hold my bass in my hands and I play it. Mm -hmm. So when I play, that's basically what I want. The PA out front is my amp, and my job is to take it with my hand, smack that string, and push that note to the back of the room or the hall or the auditorium, and my whatever I have on stage, it's nice to have something that looks cool, but it's just a monitor. The PA is my amp, and the way I push my note to the back is with my right hand. And my Rockman, of course, with that, you can hit it as hard as you can, possibly. And and, and it's just evolved. It's my technique and my sound. So I don't have any kind of dynamics or finesse or whether I want to sound. I can sound like a double bass to a, to a Rickenbacker. is all with my hand. And you mentioned strings. Do you have a particular choice in a brand of strings? Well, um... Brand new, so, and round round. Gauge depends on the gig. So for Snake Eye 7, for the majority of the tunes, I have to drop my E down to a D, which, you know, took a while to get used to because you know, now an A is a G to my, you know, it's a mental process. Plus, we tune the whole band tunes down a half step. So for that, I'll use a heavier gauge string. Where if I was in standard tuning, then I would use maybe like a, a 45 to a 95 or a 100. As far as the brand in the studio, I'll go to Roto Sounds. Brand new set every, you know, like for the Medicine Man album. Um, I think I used three sets of strings for the nine tune. I had a week slotted in the studio to do the album, and I finished in seven hours. Wow. Yeah. So it, it, that was good for whoever was paying for the studio time. I would have gone through three sets of strings for that easily. As far as live performance, the brand, most like most music stores, generic brands are made in the Dean Markey factory or somewhere where as long as they're brand new, they're fine. And it's a road and it's round mouth, more the gauge and the type of string than the brand. 
but definitely in the studio, I go for Roto Sound. With the recent release, what future projects are, are you guys thinking about with Snake Eyes 7? Well, the madman's got, like, his brain is just full. He The, the stuff just slides uh, out of his brain, and he has a, a library of, or he doesn't even need that. He can just come up with stuff. And then he throws it at Danny, the singer, who does this amazing talent for just writing words and structure. And he, you know, he knows where we are, and, uh, and that's how it happens, basically. Nobody nobody gives me instruction what to do. I just do what I do. And like, and same with Eric uh, Young, the drummer. We do what we do, and... But this music was made for us, so it's as a natural fit. So I mean, I imagine they try. They might have thought they were going to tell us something, but then when they listen to it, they go, "Well, okay, we'll just go with that because it, it, it's right." Originally, I just got some sketch pads sent to me on wave files, and I was working them up. And I had a couple of buddy bass players going, "Oh, I'll critique what you're doing, and we'll figure out what you should do." And I, you know, this stuff writes itself. Like, I, I find that with music, if you know your way around. Then there's nothing to think about. You just play, and it writes itself. And that's basically what happened here. Same with things there. It came in, and just everything. Like there was no nobody told either one of us on anything to change that, do this. It's just like, oh, great, thanks. And then listen back, and it is. We're, we're real happy with with what we're doing here. And as far as future plans, well, I got like Cole uh, has at least another two albums worth of material to go right now. It's just a matter of getting band camp together out west, and which we all fly in and hang out for a week or two, just hang out in the studio and play and have a great time. And that's our process. Everything is done in-house. Uh, Danny filmed our videos. Cam has the studio. So all our recording and all our videos are done in the band. And so far, it's working fine. I appreciate you taking some time to share part of your journey and the whole process. This most recent album, Medicine Man, which is available now. If people want to know what you guys are up to, the best place is www.snakeeyes7, and that's a numeric 7.com. That way they can kind of stay on top of the progress it's making or when a new album comes up or if there's any tour information or anything of, of the like. Right, or... Chavis Records, uh, Highball Music, Bill Chavis. He's, uh, he's the guy. Hey, Bill. And folks, you've seen it here. Mike Sillis coming to you directly on Bass Musician Magazine. Thanks for basing out with us here on BassMusicianMagazine.com.